Hello and good morning and welcome to our Churches Together in Selton and Addington joint Good Friday service. We should this morning have a meeting in Selton Hall but given the current restrictions we're just not able to do that. But we are still meeting together albeit in our homes and through the wonder that is the internet. And I guess the internet has become quite a powerful tool for us as churches in the last couple of weeks as we have sought to carry on meeting together, be it through online services or online prayer meetings or even as life groups and house groups meeting together. And today is no different. We are still meeting together, albeit in our homes, and we are on a screen. But we are still going to be able to worship Jesus together. We can still sing and we can sing as loudly as we like. Uh, we are still going to pray and there will be opportunities to reflect and to consider the incredible work of the cross. Usually after the service on Good Friday we would have a walk of witness where we walk from one building to another building and there's a cross that goes ahead of us and we walk in silence and there's often a drum beating. Um, and again, obviously this year that can't happen. So instead, we've invited you all to put up a picture of a cross in your window. Uh, hopefully you've all been emailed one, but if you haven't emailed one, that doesn't matter. You can simply draw uh, a picture of a cross on a, on, a, on a piece of paper and put that in your window. And maybe this afternoon when you're out for your walk and you see crosses in windows, you might be prompted just to pray for the person or the family that lives there or pray for the street that you're on, or even the church that they represent. So I'm gonna pray for us now, and then we're gonna carry on worshiping Jesus. Father, I want to thank you so much that we can meet together like this. I want to ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would come right now into each of our homes, that we would experience a fresh measure of you. Father, I pray that as we worship you and consider you, that even today we'd experience something more of your love and that we'd be filled to the overflow of your presence. Amen. It, it was a different kind of Passover to say the least. Uh, I remember right when we sat down, Philip leaned over to me and he whispers, Hey Thomas, I feel like something special is going to happen tonight. <laughs> I looked at him, I said, I doubt it. I was wrong. <laughs> Jesus got up from the table. He, he walked over and grabbed a basin of water and a towel. And I remember at the time thinking to myself, what's Jesus doing with the foot water? You know, I doubt he's going to wash somebody's feet. <laughs> I was wrong. He knelt down and began to wash Bartholomew's feet. Bart just sat there. He, uh, he didn't say anything. He didn't move. None of us did. Jesus finished and went on to James and Andrew and the rest of us. I remember at the time thinking, this is so strange yet wonderful. And then I thought, I doubt anybody's going to say anything right now. I was wrong. <laughs> you know who broke the silence. Peter. No way you're going to wash our feet. I mean, that's what I told him. He could wash other people's feet, but he wasn't going to wash mine. I looked at him and I said, Jesus, you're not going to wash our feet. I mean, you're the king. And he looked at me and he said, well, then you can have nothing to do with me. And I'm like, ouch. Okay, wash my feet, wash my hands, wash my whole body if you have to. He looked at me and said, no, your feet will be fine, Peter. In the midst of him washing our feet, he teaches us servanthood. Then Jesus took some bread and some wine. He blessed it and he served it to us. He said it was... Uh, a new covenant with his blood. And he said, um, tonight all of you will lose faith in me. I remember thinking right then, lose faith in you? Never. But I didn't say anything. I just sat there. I couldn't just sit there, I had to say something. So I looked at him and I said, Jesus, I love you. You can count on me. Everybody else may fall away, but I will not. You can count on me. He looked at me and he smiled. He said, Peter, you'll deny me three times for tomorrow morning. Ouch. The next thing I knew, we were wrapping things up and we were headed to the garden to pray. Once we got to the garden, um, it's 
just got crazy. Um, Jesus asked Peter, James, and myself to go further in the garden with him and pray, and we did. We tried. We kept falling asleep. Um, Jesus kept waking us up. I remember one time he said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's true. It's all a blur. Uh, and I think this whole mess got started because of Judas. Did he really think what he was doing was right? There. There he is. He's the one you want. The one praying by himself. Now the others, they will come up and try to create some scene. But the one that I kiss on the cheek, that's the one you want. Now 30 pieces of silver, right? That's what we agreed upon. 30 pieces. Forget about the rest. The one that I kiss on the cheek, that's the one you want. A kiss? Judas betrays Jesus with the kiss of a friend? Uh, and then it, it got crazy. Uh, Peter, <laughs> Peter grabs a sword and he, he cuts off this guy's ear. And Jesus... Jesus just reached down and picked it up and put it right back on the guy's head as if nothing had happened. And then, um, and then they took him. I'd love to tell you that we fought for him, but we didn't. Everyone ran. I ran. I'm so ashamed. What have I done? What have I done? Was I so stupid to think that... I've killed him. I've killed him. I've crucified Jesus.
I crucified Jesus. It's what the crowd wanted and that's what they got. And personally, I don't feel like that man did anything to deserve that, but I was just a soldier doing my job. When the governor gave his sentence, that's when I would go to work. I loved that job. I felt like I was administering justice every time I nailed someone to a tree. But that man, that man didn't deserve that. It didn't make sense to me. It makes no sense. There I was, rotten in a jail cell, for stealing, murdering. You name it, I've done it. And I knew the next time I stepped foot outside that jail cell, well, and that was it. So the guards, they came and got me, and they put me beside this guy that was beaten to a pulp. Then Governor Pilate started asking the crowd, which one of these men do you want me to set free? I mean, it was obvious. I mean, the crowd, they're going to say, let Jesus go. And then I was going to tell them where they could go. And then the crowd, they started chanting Barabbas. I mean, I mean, they were saying my name. They were saying my name over and over and over again. The guards, they threw me to the crowd and, and, they, and they took Jesus to Golgotha. I mean, I mean, one minute I, I am a man marked for death and then the next I'm, I'm free. It made no sense. So I followed him all the way to Golgotha. I was stationed at Golgotha that day. We just raised the second criminal when they brought him to me. I'll never forget the way he looked. He'd been beaten, spit on, whipped. He was unrecognizable as a man, hideous. What was left of his clothes were stripped off of him and he was thrown down on the cross. That's when I went to work. Generally, when you crucify a man, the first hand is the most difficult. The criminal wants to get away, he fights you. So I would have two soldiers hold him down, but this guy, he didn't put up a fight. I just thought he was exhausted. As an executioner, I've been called every name in the book. I've had men yell at me, plead with me. But I wasn't prepared for that. He looked at us. He looked at me. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He forgave me. Forgive them. He said, forgive them. Who is he? Forgive. It should have been me up there. I was the one that was supposed to be hanging on that cross. He took my place. Then I looked up, and I remember he took a uh, deep, agonizing breath. And he said, it is finished. And then, he died. Surely, this man was the son of God. Psalm 91. You who live in the shelter of the Most High who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler, you will not fear the terror of the night, or the arrow that flies by day, or the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. 
You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honour them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. So here we are, marking Easter in a different way than we normally would, just as we are doing everything in a different way this year. So Good Friday means no gathering together, no walking and witnessing together, no sharing of hot cross buns. Instead, we find ourselves joining together in this new virtual way. Over the last month, many of us have found ourselves leaning into God and his word, with an added urgency and intensity. We reach instinctively for texts and verses which the people of God have turned to in times of need in the past. On numerous occasions recently, either praying on my own or with others, I find myself drawn back to the Psalms. I find myself drawn afresh to the image of the God who is fortress and strength which we find in Psalm 46. I've, I've been comforted by the reminder of Psalm 121 that God neither slumbers nor sleeps. And like a number of other people I've spoken to, I've also found myself going back to Psalm 91, which we heard earlier, and especially to its evocative and its soul nurturing opening words. Whoever dwells, in the shelter of the Most High, will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Here's a psalm which is all about the theme of trust. It comes to us in the form of one person who's found God to be the protector and either trying to persuade someone else about God's faithfulness. When we read these opening words of Psalm 91, my guess is that they might remind some of us of the title of a famous book which was written many years ago in 1958 called Shadow of the Almighty. And the author was the American missionary Elizabeth Elliot. And the book tells the story of the life of her first husband, Jim Elliot. And yet in some ways, it seems like an old title for the book and an old text to pick when speaking about him because many of us might know that he was one of five missionaries who was killed by tribes people in Ecuador in 1956. And in fact, that wasn't the only experience of terrible loss which Elizabeth Elliot faced. Her second husband, a theology lecturer called Addison Leach, died of illness when they'd only been married for four years. So if anything, her story seems to be an example of how many people we know who are Christians do find their lives to be marked by suffering and loss. Look at verses five and six in the talk there of how we needn't fear the terror of night or the pestilence that stalks in the darkness. They're great promises but all of us will know people who love God and are faithful to him. And yet they do have suffering come near to them. When we read here about the plague that destroys at midday, it's hard not to think about the plague, which is presently destroying lives near to us and all around the world, in fact, and which doesn't seem to discriminate between those who follow God and those who don't. And so it might be the case 
But some of us have read this psalm recently and wondered, does, does all this hold? Can the promises really be taken at face value? Is, is this a passage which, which does what it says in the tin? Perhaps the most striking example of these promises not coming through is hinted at in verses 11 and 12. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Do those words ring a bell? Do you recognise those promises from anywhere else? Because they are the same ones quoted by the devil in the temptation stories we find in the Gospels. Do you remember how he encourages Jesus to jump off the Temple Mount and see what happens? And when they're quoted by the devil, Jesus is quick to come back at him with a warning which demonstrates his wariness of taking these promises for granted. Talks about the importance of, of not putting God to the test. And of course that temptation story, the back and forth between Jesus and the devil, over these words seems particularly poignant when you look at it from the vantage point of Psalm 91. Because you could say Jesus is maybe the most striking example ever of someone for whom these promises did not come true. We feel acutely aware of that on a day like today when we are confronted again with the brutal reality of his crucifixion and death. And yet we can see what he went through from an even longer and more far-reaching perspective, from the perspective of Sunday, where we see the eventual deliverance, the eventual victory, all of the ways in which that suffering and pain were used by God who rescued him. So on this strange Good Friday, in this year of the virus, you might find it helpful to spend time reflecting on the psalm in the piece of music and the images which we'll see next. Think about its majestic opening. Think about the wonderful statements of promise with which it concludes in its final verses. I will rescue. I will protect. I will answer. I will be present in trouble. I will deliver. I will show my salvation. Even in the promises. There is an acknowledgement that trouble can come, but also that there is deliverance for those who remain faithful. Deliverance from Jesus, who was so incredibly faithful in his obedience and love to his Father, who was never going to be seduced when the words of this psalm were twisted and thrown in his face to try and get him off course. Jesus, who is also incredibly faithful in his love to us, as he goes to the cross. Jesus whose pain and death and resurrection are the means by which all of God's promises are ultimately fulfilled and a means by which God can bring healing and can bring salvation to us, to Selston, to our world, even in the hardest of seasons like this one.
As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And there they offered Jesus wine mixed with a bitter substance. But after tasting it, he would not drink it. They crucified him and divided his clothes among them by throwing dice. After that, they sat there and watched him. Above his head, they put a written notice which said, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then they crucified two bandits with him, one on his right and one on his left. People, people passing by shook their heads and hurled insults at Jesus. You are going down to tear the temple down and build it up again in three days. Save yourself if you are God's son. Come on down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the laws and the elders jeered at him. He saved others but could not save himself. Isn't he king of Israel? If he comes down off the cross now, we will believe in him. He trusts in God and claims to be God's son. Well then, let us see if God wants to save him now. Even the bandits who had been crucified with him insulted him in the same way. At noon, the whole country was covered in darkness and it lasted for three hours. At about three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud shout, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the people standing there heard him and said, he is calling out for Elijah. One of them ran up at once, took a sponge soaked in cheap wine and put it on the end of a stick and tried to make him drink it. But the others said, wait, let us see if Elijah will come to save him. Jesus again gave a loud cry and breathed his last. Then the curtain hanging in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split apart, the graves broke open and many of God's people who had died were raised to life. They left their graves and after Jesus rose from the death, they went into the holy city where many people saw them. When the army officer and the soldiers with him who were watching Jesus saw the earthquake and everything else that happened, they were terrified and said, he really was the son of God. There were many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee and helped him. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary mother of James and Joseph and the wife of Zebedee. This is the word of the Lord.
gracious and ever-living God, we come to you this day when your Son gave up his life for us. As we bear the weight of the cross in our hearts, unable to gather and walk together as your children, we pray that those who look upon the crosses in our windows may know that they are united with all who walk your way, with all who know the truth of your forgiveness, bought at such a price, and all who know the fullness of life that is your resurrection gift. May God bless us on this journey, cleanse our hearts, and fill us with trust and hope. Amen.